Welcome to The State of Us. Beyond mainstream cable news and party lines, with a millennial and a boomer, The State of Us pushes past the noise and uncovers all the issues that matter. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. It's a hoax. Well, that's not what we're going to be saying today. Welcome to The State of Us. Beyond mainstream cable news and party lines, with a millennial and a boomer, the state of us pushes past the noise and uncovers all the issues that matter. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. It's a hoax. Well, that's not what we're going to be saying today. A lot of people, right? A lot of people out there. Oh, it's not real. It's not happening. I don't know. A lot of headlines recently. A lot of climate change stuff seems to be going on. We've always had these things. Well, we've always had things that are like these things. I don't know if we've always had these things. Have we always had this many wildfires? Have we always had this many severe weather events? Well, the data says no. Maybe maybe you say something differently, but the data says no. So today we're looking at climate change and uh, specifically three components. We've got the situation, what's happening right now in the world, right? The challenges ahead, what's the cost to do something about this? The practical side, can we really do something? Even if we agree that we should, which we don't, but even if we did, what would it take? And what are those solutions? So there's a lot to cover today, but any conversation on climate change and the future of the population of the world would not be complete without. True Chat senior historian and an educator of more than 30 years, here is your friendly redneck liberal, Lance Jackson. I mean, do you doubt the Great Ice Age? You know, I mean, we we have the remnants of the Great Lakes to, to prove that there was a Great Ice Age. So I think we need to understand that our Earth has gone through many changes and that as you add species to it, it's going to make it change even more. That is a perspicacious uh, opinion, okay? Perspicacious, the word of the day as an adjective, four syllables, P-E-R-S-P-I-C-A-C-I-O-U-S, means having keen judgment or understanding, acutely perceptive perspicacious. And if you want to use it as a noun, it is perspicaciousness. So there you go. Good. We're going to be acute in our judgment and try to be perceptive here as we talk about climate change and give you the facts that well, this is what's happened. This is what happened in the past. And then the understanding is here's what will happen in the future if we don't change anything. Lots to talk about. Here's here's driving at home, Lance. Why do you care? Well, in 50 years, one third of the world's people could likely live in places that feel like the Sahara, where the average summer high tops 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And I don't care how tough you are, 104 degrees ain't not pleasant. That's a little warm. It's a little warm. Well, and things don't grow. I mean, right. not, not yeah. even, you're not even getting into, okay, I'm going to survive, but what are you going to eat? And, yep. you know, how are you going to keep water? And so anyway, you got a lot of other issues to deal with besides just the heat. So we're referencing um, several pieces of information today, okay? Not, uh, not just one. We've got the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and National Geographic. Uh, of course, you can find the material for today's program linked at thestateofus.org. And as we go through this, we'd like to hear your thoughts. You can email us, info at thestateofus.org. So let's look at the the three big components of understanding what's going on. Um, heat and why it's dangerous, sea level rise, and the other severe weather events. The two main ones, obviously, being the two biggest components are heat and sea level rise. And you might be thinking at home, hmm, why would sea level rise concern me? I don't live near the sea. Well, here's the thing that drove it home for me, Lance, because I mean, right here in Ohio, 
we, we ain't got a sea nearby. Um, <laughs> we're, right. we're, we, we're not particularly, pers- uh, you know, it wouldn't seem like, and here's the key, that we are particularly um, at risk in regards to sea level rise. Here's the kicker. About half of the world's population lives within 60 miles of a coast. Half. So some 4 billion-ish people live within 60 miles of a coast. The reason that is important is not only uh, are there lots of people, right, that are in what will become an issue in regards to just general higher seas, but then as we have more of these severe weather events, you've got people, well, you know, I'm I'm 30 miles inland, so I'm not really worried about, you know, in a higher elevation, I'm not really worried about the flooding component. Right, but the severe hurricanes can still reach you and cause flooding and problems for you as well. The the other big component here, Lance, because, you know, so why do I care? Because I'm part of the half of the world population that doesn't live there. Well, as these people leave these areas, where do you think they're going to go? They're going to go to everywhere that's not within 60 miles of a coast, right? Which, lo and behold, is the other half of the world population. So the point is, sea level rise doesn't just affect people that live near the coast. It affects all of us because when the people near the coast, which is about half of the world's population, have to make adjustments to how and where they live, that is going to affect us. Aside from they make up a huge component of the economy. Um, Obviously, everybody that lives, for example, in New York City is within 60 miles of a coast. Um, And that's the case for many of the world's very largest cities. But I think you bring up, just by introducing that topic, you bring up what is the issue slash problem when we discuss global warming. And that is, well, even if I believe in it, which you have that, which you already stated, but like you said, people are like, well, it doesn't affect me. You know, so, okay, so this so it's going to, I live in Ohio. You said it, I live in Ohio. Why do I care? And I know you pointed it out, but most people don't take it to that second level like you did. They just say, well, it doesn't bother me. It's not too hot where I live. It's not too dry where I live. I'm getting plenty of rain. I'm living comfortably. This is somebody else's problem. You know, that to me is the crux of the issue is that we don't take it when we hear about, you know, forest fires in, in the western part of the United States or Canada, or when we read about in the Northwest, you know, 105 degree temperatures in in Seattle uh, or Portland, Oregon, and it's warmer there than it is in Miami, Florida at the, on the same day, you know, for an extended two week period. We're like, yeah, well, I'm doing OK. So, uh, you know, th- that's just a localized problem. That's just too bad for them. That's what we've got to change, folks. It's that mindset that these problems are localized or, oh, wow, it's really horrible that Bangladesh is underwater again. You know, I don't even know where Bangladesh is, but I remember every couple of years I hear about Bangladesh being under a typhoon or, or uh, you know, this Asian island, you know, this island out in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Oh, wow. Um, it's submerged and it's gone now. Oh, that's, that's really too bad. But um, yeah, it doesn't affect me, so I don't care. That's the attitude we have to change. You know, I understand all of the the things that you're saying that that should drive it home to people, but we've got to change that basic attitude that just because it's happening somewhere else, it doesn't affect us. It, as you pointed out, it does affect us and it's not happening somewhere else. It's happening on our planet. We all inhabit this planet together. And if, we are all causing the problem, some of us causing it more than others, and it's going to take all of us to fix it. I want to share two things with you, Lance. One is addressing uh, the deniers, and the other one is talking about heat as another example. Because rightfully so, like take Ohio, for example. We might look at it and say, would it really be that bad if our winters got milder? I mean, right? I mean, who really is going to be upset about that? If if we have winters where there's less snow and it doesn't get as cold, that seems like it'd be okay. But let's take, for example, uh, I have family that lives in Arizona, okay? Mm-hmm. Phoenix, right? Right. A literal desert where they get less than eight inches of rain per year. And keep in mind, they've known this. I mean, they knew this when they built the city. Most people in Arizona probably don't think a lot about 
where their water comes from. Well, for those that don't know, there's a thing called the Arizona Project, which is essentially a massive undertaking to hold and send water to the places that don't have enough, like Phoenix, Phoenix being the chief example. And well, how does the Arizona Project get its water? Well, it relies on snowmelt from the Rocky Mountains, which are several hundred miles away. So what if the snow, what if it snowed less in a given year? What if there was less snow? What if there was less water? Well, you've probably already heard, if you live in that part of the country, conversations about water rationing, right, on the way. And in a lot of areas, it already exists. Very likely scenario. Here's just if things just keep going the way they are. Okay, forget about dire predictions and all this, right? Arizona is going to, Phoenix in particular, is going to run into a water issue. So you say, well, what does this, any of this have to do with me? Here's, here's what happens, Lance. My family, right, who I don't see that often, but they live in Arizona. They've lived in Phoenix. Water rationing sets in. So you go from using the average of today, which is 200 gallons per person per household, down to 75 gallons per person per household. Well, now several things happen. Um, you know, one, you have to completely overhaul your home because you can't keep using water the way you've always been to. Forget showers. You're going to a bath once a week, right? Mm -hmm. Just like the pioneers used to do. And all that may just sound like a big inconvenience. Well, these people chose to live there. They could choose to leave, right? Well, it's not that simple because the other thing is, where does Arizona get most of its power from? Oh, well, there's this big dam, cup two of them, that generate all their water or generate all their electric. And how do they generate electric? Well, they generate it with water. So if we have less water and we have to do water rationing, now we have less electricity. So now it's hotter, right? And more people are dying because the AC is not working. So we just stay inside, but now we don't have power to run the air conditioning. <clears throat> well, because we've built these big population centers in a desert. Right. And so the only way that they can continue to exist is through our technology. But our technology is dependent upon mother nature. So that's where it works, folks. Okay. I mean, because as you're describing this, I'm thinking, okay, the city of Las Vegas, Nevada, almost the entire region of Southern California, they all draw from the same water source and the same power source. And the only reason they, and the reason nobody lived there a hundred years ago, because it was a desert and, we didn't, could. and <laughs> we didn't have the technology to have people live comfortably there. And, and Here's the extension of, well, that affects people in Phoenix, right? And in Southern California, but what does it do to me? Well, if you know anybody that lives there, eventually, here's what happens. I mean, do you really want to move somewhere where there's water rationing? Do you really want to move somewhere where there's constant blackouts? Probably not. So what happens? As those problems become more consistent, the demand for housing in those areas drops and actually goes in reverse. So now your family right, who owned their half a million dollar or million dollar, you know, one acre or half an acre piece of land, it's not worth that anymore. And they actually owe more on it than they could sell it for, if they can sell it at all. So now you've trapped people in these locations, which obviously depresses the economy, right, uh, and drives up housing prices across other parts of the United States. So there we go again with the, even if you don't know anybody that lives there, when those places face these problems, you have tens of millions of people that live in these areas. It's going to affect us because it's going to affect the economy. And that's what we're going to talk about as we go forward, Lance, right? What's this going to cost? Because it, it all sounds bad. It all sounds like we got to do something. But are we really going to do anything? That's what we have to find out. Keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. We are The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. Before we dive into the cost, Lance said something before the show that I think is just essential that people hear. For the people out there that don't feel that climate change is, is a real thing, or you feel that it's not man-made. I think you said something really good before the show, Lance, and, and what did you tell me about how long have we known, uh, you know, that, that climate change not only was real, but has been caused by people and have allowed politics 
and have allowed, you know, personal denial to get in the way of those things. Basically, you know, we had the creation of Earth Day in the 70s, but in the last 40 or 50 years that I've been alive, this has been a story. More and more information has come out. As computers got better, more and more computer models have come out. And it's like, how much proof, air quotes there, do you need? You know, it's like in one of these articles, uh, we're reading that all the flooding in Germany, you're like, what, there's flooding in Germany? Yes, the floods in Europe this summer have killed at least 165 people, most of them in Germany, Europe's most powerful economy. Across Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands, hundreds more have been reported missing, which suggests the death toll could rise. And then this is the sentence that just says, put my blood pressure through the roof. It says, questions are now being raised about whether the authorities adequately warned the public about risk. And my comment is, how much more warning do you need? We're telling you. It's been there, okay? I've, I've been a reader of National Geographic since I learned how to read. It's there. If you want to deny it, I guess that's your option. That's your opinion. I mean, that's your, that's your right is to deny. But then don't turn around when all this stuff happens and say, oh, nobody told me. Number one, if you're listening to the show, we're telling you right now. But we've been telling people. And nobody takes it seriously. Well, unfortunately, it's not, again, hyperbole there. Apologize. Many of us do take it seriously, but not enough. And we're not changing it. And as Justin's going to get into with the facts, it's getting worse. Even with some of us trying and some of us believing what we're reading and trying to do what we can about it, we're not doing enough. And it's still getting worse. And the problem is now we're to the point that even if all of us jump in, the question becomes, is it going to be enough since we've waited so long to do what we should have been doing for the last 40 or 50 years? The other thing I'll just say real real quick on the note of the deniers, Lance, I read this. I wish I could take credit for it, but real succinct um, kind of rebuttal to that is, so what is the alternative proposition being offered? If this is a great hoax, right, and you know all these scientists have somehow coordinated. How did you get, in 2018, Lance, this is a real thing, there was a review, okay, of 20,000 peer-written papers across the world. So not just the United States, but across the world, from conservative places to liberal places to everything in between. And 100%, and I'm not rounding, okay, that's that's not hyperbole, 100% of those 20 thousand peer-reviewed papers, which by the way, each of which averaged probably three authors a piece. So 60,000 scientists from around the world across every major country are 100% in agreement that climate change is a real threat and that we are largely responsible for it. So if it was some kind of grand hoax, why have we not been able to get any of those 60,000 scientists to admit that they were somehow coerced or some kind of deathbed confession or some giant leak or God knows what else? Because that seems to happen with everything everywhere if there's ever, you know, really something going on. Why hasn't that happened? Well, look, just let me, one of your heroes, I think, Neil deGrasse Tyson, was reading an interview with him in the Sunday New York Times magazine. And he said that he had the spouse of one of his working partners who denied the moon landing. And the person said, well, you prove to me, you show me the evidence and I'll believe that we actually landed on the moon. So Neil deGrasse Tyson showed pictures, da, 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 da. person looked at it and said, yeah, I looked at all that. And at the bottom it said, the pictures were provided by NASA. So it's still a hoax. And Neil deGrasse Tyson said, I can't do anything. I've given you the evidence. You are still in denial. You're not ready to believe. And there's nothing that I can do to make you believe when you're going to deny the facts. And that's somebody who knows more about what's going on than I do. And he basically said, if you present everybody the facts and people still don't believe, they're not ready to believe yet. And at that point, he told the interviewer, there's nothing I can do. The facts are there. You know, we, the proof is there. And people want to get on Facebook and believe somebody who's not part of this contingent 
that you spoke of and say, well, that's who I believe because they're not ready to believe the evidence, even when the evidence is presented to them. That's right. There's the third of the population that says climate change is absolutely real. It's a big threat and we got to do something about it. There's a third of the population that says, yeah, I think climate change is real, but I don't really know what we do about it. And that's for somebody else to figure out. And then there's the third of the population that says climate change ain't real and I ain't doing nothing. In fact, I'll do everything I can to supposedly make it worse. Right. So I think those are your you, kind of yeah. your your large three groups, right? Um, and the the key with that group, right? Because the the second group, that group that's yeah, climate change is real, but I don't really know what to do about it, and I don't. I'm really probably not going to do anything about it. That's for somebody else to figure right. out. Me, me not using throwaway plastics isn't really going to make any difference. Exactly. Right. Um, you know, there's there's kind of that group, um, and that's a different. They've accepted the premise, right, that climate change is a real thing. So that's a whole different conversation than it is when you have people that say it's not a real thing in the first place. Um, but I think part of it is for for everybody, I don't want to believe that climate change is going to drastically change the way the world looks when I die. But that doesn't mean that I shouldn't believe it just because I don't want it to be true, right? It's going to be true either way. Uh, so I might as well do what I can to try to make the best of it and change it rather than to deny it. You know, now if, you know, you're 88 years old and you think you're going to die in the next three years, then I guess if you really don't care what happens to the world after you're gone, you don't have much to worry about, you know, but. But I would come back with people worried about it when you were young or before you were born. Otherwise, you wouldn't have your air conditioning and you probably wouldn't be alive to be 88 years old because they wouldn't have developed the tests for the medicines that you take to keep you alive at 88. You would have died 20 or 30 years ago. So every day that you live, you we are grateful for the people who came before us with what they did that allowed us to continue to live. And we should all have that same attitude is that we need to spend every one of our breaths doing what we can so the people that follow us have a better life than we do. We shouldn't just do it because what's well, going to make my life better. That is a short-sighted attitude that leads to more problems than solutions. Because a lot of the things that we have today, I would say all of the things we have today were because people put aside that thought and said, I am going to do things that will better mankind in perpetuity. You have to realize that we only exist because people cared about us before we were ever born. And we need to start caring about those generations that are going to come after we're long gone. Yep. Well, we have to. Um, I, we don't have to, but... No, we don't have to. But then we've been given this and we didn't make it better for the next generation. And people did that for us. We need to do it for th those that follow. We need to try, right? Do our dag level best, right? <laughs> but then that's my attitude about everything. If you're going to do it, do it to the best of your ability. And I guess that's what the deniers are doing. They, if they want to ruin the planet, they're going to do it to the best of their ability. They're going to ruin the planet as quickly as they can. Oh, so here's here's the other side of this, right? Is we talked about, okay, well, we're going to do our darndest, right? We've we've arrived at that point. Will our darndest be enough? I'll give you this to think about. The uh, International Renewable Energy Agency, which is an intergovernmental organization, uh, said in March of 2021 that the world would need to invest $115 trillion U.S. dollars through 2050 in clean technologies such as solar power and electric vehicles to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Keep in mind that those are the climate goals made at the 2015 Paris Accords and were revived in the Earth Day Climate Summit that was hosted um, back in March with President Biden or back in April with President Biden. Um, so think about that for a second. $115 trillion by 2050 worldwide. It sounds like a lot, but is it? Keep it here on The State of Us and we'll be right back. We are The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. 
President Biden has set a target of sharply reducing U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. It would force companies to speed up the pace of change and present many new expenses. But it's important, and this is from the Wall Street Journal, to understand that much of the world's hopes for reducing carbon emissions, however, rest on China and India, which are heavily dependent on coal, which is considered the dirtiest fossil fuel to generate power. China is the number one emitter globally. If the gross domestic product of the United States, or of the world, excuse me, is about the same annually as what we have to spend between now and 2050 to address climate change, I think the answer is, is it a lot of money? Absolutely, it's a lot of money. Is it impossible? No, it's definitely not impossible. You know, uh, the world. And, what, and what's the situation going to be if we don't do it? Exactly. <clears throat> I mean, that's right. I mean, that's the third piece. Can you afford not, not to, to do, do it? it? I like that. Yep. You know, um, so here's here's part of the ballooning effect, though. And this is, I think, part of what gives people pause and says, is it really worth trying to do anything? Because it sounds like we can't do nothing. Sure, it costs a lot, but that's right. Direct cost. Things like solar power, electric vehicles, that'll limit it hopefully, to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, But the other point is, uh, David uh, Victor, who's an international relations professor at the University of California, San Diego, who focuses on climate policies, said getting to zero requires difficult tasks of eliminating essentially all fossil fuels. You think, well, if we're getting, if we're changing power generation and we're changing our vehicles over, isn't that enough? Well, take a moment right now, and if you're in your car or your home, how many things can you count that are within sight that are made of plastic? Because all of that right there, folks, is fossil fuels. It's crude oil. I mean, it's a huge component of how we make almost every plastic on planet Earth. And it's become not only a you know cheap alternative, in many cases, it has become the only option for manufacturing many types of goods. Um, I mean, just sitting here in the control room at TrueChat, every monitor that I'm looking at has plastic around it, the speakers, the keyboard. Uh, Of course, the mixer that we have here has a lot of plastic in it. The table is made of plastic. Um, My water bottle has a plastic lid and a plastic straw inside of it. Um, So, and if you go home and Lance's glasses sitting on the table there, oh, they're made of plastic. And that's to say nothing of, as the gentleman points out, what do we do about cement? What do we do about steel? What do we do about agriculture? What do we do about aviation and shipping? What are we going to do to make things better for the next generation? You know, the people who came up with this idea of plastic and discovered, you know, we've done, uh, you know, we, we did that book, uh, Anointed with Oil, and talked about, you know, the, the growth of, of the oil industry worldwide and its power and its effect. Okay, great. Things happen. Things change. That's, you know, that's just what happens. That's technology. That's what it's all about. Okay, now we're reaching a stage where eh, this is hurting us. So... Now we got to get on the ball and do what we can to make the situation best and try to stall for time to come up with something to take the place of that. Because there hasn't always been plastic. We used wood. We used coal. We used, so, okay, we'll find something else that won't harm the planet as much, and then we'll, we'll leave a better place behind. That's, where, that's what we need to do. It's that attitude. It's like it doesn't deny. It's like, okay, so this is the issue. Well, we discovered this. To make the world a better place from what we were using earlier. Now we need to find, and we have people who are working on it, and we have to be willing to accept it and adapt to it, finding things to take the place of plastic that will not hurt the environment. And we need to start doing those things, and that will buy us the time till we find the next great thing that will advance society further down the road. That's the way this works. That's what history tells us, that and and when it, and, and in the past, when mankind has been in a dire situation, mankind has pulled together or they didn't survive. You want to, you want your, you know, the reason to care about this? That's it. Because, you know, there were people other than us, you know, there were human species that died out because they didn't adapt to the changes. And just survive. I mean, I think the reality is one of the biggest effects of climate change is that 
our ability to produce food for a worldwide population are already being strained. They're going to be diminished further, and the population is supposed to grow, continue to grow through 2050. We have some major challenges to face. And so the question becomes, well, what can we do about it, right? Well, we have to spend a lot of money. Um, but what you can do personally is I think, you know, uh, no, it may not be quite where it needs to be for you to adopt some of the things that can be done, right? But you do have some control over certain things. Um, I think it becomes really hard when you look at everything because, uh, you know, uh, for example, just backstory, right? Uh, my first two vehicles were trucks. One was a 1980 Dodge Dakota. The other one was a brand new Chevy Silverado, of course, both of which were completely powered by gasoline. Um, I grew up on a farm. Diesel fuel, obviously very common for the operation of a lot of our machinery. Um, you know, fuel was a huge part of life. Fossil fuel was a huge part of life. And unfortunately, for a lot of the stuff that happens on the farm, it still is. But I've been able to make the switch in my household to two electric powered vehicles. Was it painless? No, it was not. Were there new things to learn? Absolutely. Is life better with these electric vehicles? Yes, it is. Are there things that are different than owning a gas vehicle? Yep. Is it a 100% net better? No. There are things that are not as good, but on the whole, there are more things that are good. And I'm not talking about the climate side. I'm just talking about the economics of owning a car and the convenience and affordability. From those components alone, purely on the economic scale, it has worked out in our favor. And yes, we wanted to do it because of climate, but also we did it because it saves us money. You know, it saves us money. And uh, same thing with the solar. You know, so I guess the point is if somebody who grew up on a very traditional, you know, farm and who's generations of people in my family have done that. Farmers are going to be some of the ones that are the heavy, most heavily affected. They're going to have to make some of the biggest adaptations. If people like that can do it, then you listening, you can do it, but you have to decide not to resist, you know, because even people that agree that it's important, once it becomes readily available, some people still resist, right? Well, not yet, you know? And those are small things that each of us can do that aren't that small when we all do them. At the same time, it's difficult because if we don't all do them, right, if I'm the only one that does it, it didn't do, it really didn't do any good in the grand scheme of things, right? Me owning two electric vehicles doesn't do squat. Me telling 20 other people, 200 other people why they shouldn't fear it, that could help, you know? Well, and the other side of it is too, you're talking about owning automobiles, which you know, I have two drivers in my house and we own three of them and they're all gasoline. Yep. But it's also not complaining if we have to pay more in taxes for the government to improve the infrastructure to the point that we have mass transit and we don't need cars. There are places in the world, right? Most of the world yeah, as you say. don't own <laughs> not cars. Not just places, most and so, people. And they, and, they, and they get, <laughs> most people have to use Mo and Joe. They, got, they have to walk. But there are other heavily populated places where they have a mass transit system that you don't need a car. And wow, that would take it even to a different level than you're talking about because you still even have more how, how much of your electric vehicle is made of plastic. You know, And if we had mass transit and you say, well, that's too expensive for an individual. No, we pay higher taxes for the infrastructure that in the long run allows us to lead a better life. You say, well, I don't want to pay more in taxes. But if you led a better life because you were paying more in taxes, then it's a better life, right? I mean, it's going to save you in the long run. And I mean, there's even that mind blowing thing. And I'm not against anything that you've done because I think it is applaudable. The things that you've done at a young age to, to make that difference. But on the, to make the big difference, we've got to get the governments to your own point at the beginning of the show and the, and the point of the articles. We have to get the major players, China, the United States, Russia, Germany, India. India, the major economies in the world on board to make the major changes that will make the difference. Because 1.5 degrees Celsius, people, is 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? And that's huge. And us individually can peck away at it. It's going to take us supporting our governments 
to make the big changes that are necessary for all of us to survive this and come out better on the other end. I think that's the message that gets lost too often is you should be doing everything that you can. And yes, there is a level of reason to that. But part of that includes the big part is making sure that your government is on board with making the changes, right? And you can have an effect on that. Um, it's not just uh, do your part, right, per, in your personal life, which you should do. Uh, you know, you should embrace it. Uh, but at the same time, it's also getting the government to do what it has to do, because the reality is they both fail, right? If the government can do everything at once, but if the consumers won't embrace it, then it really doesn't matter. And vice versa is true. If the consumers embrace it, but the government won't pull its weight and come along, that's not any good either. So it, it, it takes that, as Lance has said, we've pulled together for many things before. We won world wars, right? Because we pulled together. This threat in many ways, threatens all of us more dire than those world wars. And that's hard for a lot of people to accept because it's an enemy we really can't see, right? It's hard to fight, but we have to treat it that way. It's a war and it's one that we have to win. Losing is... Not an option. Right. Losing is just not an option for any of us. And that's the thing. It's not each other, right? It's an existential threat. Uh, to the people of planet Earth. And it doesn't matter if you live in the United States, Russia, China, whatever. All of the small ball politics crap that we fight over all the time won't matter when Florida and New York are underwater and half of the population of the United States has migrated inward and housing prices have over doubled in your part of the country. 